I want to start by sharing a story from the Bible, which you may already know, but then sharing a story which you may not know. The first is the story of a man named Naaman. Naaman was a mighty warrior, a great general among the people of Syria. Now, Syria was also known as Aram, which we talked about last week in their war against the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Though this story that we're talking about today is set one generation later. Naaman had power, riches, respect, and the friendship of the king. But none of that mattered. Because Naaman was stricken with the deadly and disfiguring disease of leprosy. There wasn't a cure. And despite the numerous battlefields Naaman had walked and the victories that he had won, he would soon die a terrible and painful death. And Naaman was willing to do anything for a cure, no matter how far-fetched the idea. And his quest eventually led him to Israel and to a man named Elisha, the prophet of God. Naaman's journey was long, and so he was furious when he didn't even get an audience with Elisha. He sent a messenger to his door to tell Naaman that if he wanted to be cured, he just had to go and dip himself in the Jordan River seven times. Now, it was bad enough that Elisha didn't show the proper respect of greeting a visitor who had traveled hundreds of miles to see him, but then he simply dismissed him by telling him to go take a bath. Take a bath? That's it? So Naaman stormed off until his servants changed his mind, convinced him to, to at least give it a shot. And who knows, maybe he needed to take a bath. <laughs> so he did. He waded into the muddy waters of the Jordan River, and putting his trust in the God of Israel, he dipped himself beneath the surface. And he arose from the waters and then submerged again and again and again seven times. And with each dip, Naaman witnessed the dreadful leprosy disappear from his skin until at the end it is said that his skin was like that of a young boy's. And he was cured. Now, Naaman was a ridiculously wealthy man. And he brought with him a, a massive amount of treasures to pay for the healing. Because for, for all Naaman knew, whoever this healer was, could have charged a small fortune for the cure. And so he brought with him a small fortune just in case. And in his caravan was 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and a variety of fine clothing. And in today's money, it would be estimated to be around $1.1 million. And in the end, Naaman offered all of this to Elisha as a gift of thanksgiving, a not-so-small token of appreciation. But Elisha didn't want it. He refused to accept it. Because after all, it was not his miracle. It was not through his power. It was God's. And I can imagine that this shocked Naaman. But it simply added more fuel to his faith. Because surely this God of Israel was the one true God. It was this God that he would serve from now on, no longer worshiping the pagan gods of Syria. And before he left, Naaman even asked forgiveness if in the future his king would force him to bow down before the other gods. Elisha told him, go in peace. And so Naaman did, returning to his homeland a newly cleansed man. And that's where the story ends, as many today often tell it. And it's a good, happy ending that would be a good way to wrap up the story. But there's more. And it's all because of a man named Gehazi. And this is our second story. Gehazi was Elisha's servant and assistant, the prophet's apprentice, who shadowed Elisha's ministry. 
He was there for, throughout the entire Naaman event. And he was mentioned in previous chapters as aiding Elisha, even being sent to perform miracles on Elisha's behalf. For years, Gehazi had witnessed the power of God through his master Elisha. There's no evidence to say that he was anything but a good man. But even good people make mistakes. And here at the end of 2 Kings chapter 5, we read about where Gehazi went wrong. As after Naaman had traveled some distance, picking up in verse 20, by the way, after Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered, but my master sent me to say that two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. And he urged Gehazi to accept them. And then he tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. And he gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. And when Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. And he sent the men away, and they left. And when he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves or vineyards or flocks or herds or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. And such is the tale of Gehazi, the prophet's apprentice. Oh, Gehazi, why? Why? What led him to this terrible mistake? Well, let's start at the beginning of the story to try to figure out what went on in his head. So we read that after Naaman left Elisha's house, he traveled a few miles down the road. Gehazi, he's trying to process all of this. This Syrian man had a mountain of wealth. And here with his own eyes, he had beheld more gold and silver than all of the gold and silver he had seen in his whole life. And this was just a gift. Oh, surely Naaman had more back in Syria. And with this money, Elisha would have been set for life. And Gehazi, by association, would too. From then on, nobody was going to ignore them or shun them. Because the people listen to men with money. But power and popularity aside, imagine how their ministry would prosper. So much good could be done in the name of the Lord. More people could be healed. Their message of repentance could spread to the nations even further. This was truly to be a blessing from God. But Elisha said, no. He turned it down. And as Gehazi saw the carts and of silver and gold roll away, he started to think about how Naaman Elisha went too easy on Naaman. He, the man got healed for free. Something in Gehazi's mind told him that that wasn't right. The dangerous thought, though, was that it was up to Gehazi to do something about it. In fact, in that verse, Gehazi makes a vow to run after Naaman, using that phrase, as surely as the Lord lives. Now, this is a phrase that we read numerous times in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. In fact, just a few verses earlier, Elisha used that same phrase, saying, As surely as the Lord's 
lives, he would not accept the gifts. And saying these words was to invoke the name of God and to apply it to your own actions. And in Gehazi's mind, God wanted him to do this. Now, one of the things we'll notice in the story is this, this delicate balance between good and bad intentions. <clears throat> From Gehazi's perspective, what he was about to do was completely justifiable. Elisha was the one who had misacted. Now, here was a man that, that wanted to give something back, but Elisha had denied him that opportunity. And perhaps in his mind, he considered that what he was doing was some sort of justice or, or rectifying the situation. However, when we look at it from reality's perspective, we have to wonder if Gehazi was really motivated by justice or if there was some other ulterior motive. We'll examine this later. But the next part of the story is that Gehazi lied. There wasn't a message to Naaman from Elisha. The two prophets that Gehazi spoke of didn't exist. He was lying to Naaman, but in his mind, it was justified. It was okay, because it was a means to an end. And Naaman, being ever generous in light of God's healing, doubled what Gehazi requested, giving him two talents of silver instead of one. Now, two talents equals roughly 150 pounds of silver. In today's standards, it would equal hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so Gehazi hurriedly returned to the house. He put the silver away, and then he went to confront Elisha. Elisha. Now, as a reminder, Elisha is the prophet of God. A man chosen by God himself to do his will and spread his message on earth. And God had given him some power, including but not limited to foretelling the future, healing, and summoning bears to attack a mob of troublemakers who had insulted his baldness. And also on this list is knowing when someone was lying to his face. And Elisha knew exactly what had happened. But still he gave Gehazi that chance to respond. He asked him, where have you been? Now, Gehazi had a chance to tell Elisha the truth. He could have very well told him that he went to see Naaman. He asked to receive a small portion of the reward. He could have even told Elisha his intentions for the money, why he did it. He could have said that he could use this for their ministry if that were the case. But, but instead, Gehazi told him, and he didn't go anywhere. And with this, Gehazi fell victim to one of the classic blunders. Never lie to a prophet. Especially one that you've personally witnessed to have the power of God on his side. Because Elisha could see right through that deception. Through the power of God, Elisha witnessed what had happened at Naaman's chariots. He saw the replay. And he knew of Gehazi's lies to Naaman. He even knew the real intentions of Gehazi's hearts, described his own wish list of what to do with the money. All of groves and vineyards, livestock, men and women to wait on him hand and foot. None of that was going to happen now because Gehazi had been caught. And as Gehazi knew full well, there was going to be consequences. Can you imagine how he must have felt? Can you imagine how foolish, how embarrassed, how ashamed? He had let his master down. He had let God down. What had he been thinking? Gehazi should have known better. He was the prophet's apprentice. He was to Elisha what Elisha had been to the great Elijah before him. Gehazi could very well have been next in the great line of prophets, but not now. His role had been to make Elisha's ministry more effective and successful by aiding him in his tasks. He was to follow Elisha's lead and to model Elisha's choices. And since Elisha had said that it was the Lord's will not to receive any of that money, Gehazi should have left it at that. 
Instead, he questioned his master and decided to take matters into his own hands, assuming that he was more in the right than him. And in irony, Gehazi was ultimately cursed with the leprosy that Naaman had just been cured of. Now, if there was some consolation, though, Leviticus 13 notes that if leprosy had advanced to the stage of being completely white, then they would no longer be unclean since they would no longer be contagious. And so this isn't the end of Gehazi's story. He would actually continue to be Elisha's apprentice. We read about him later in 2 Kings where he testified to Elisha's power in front of the king of Israel. Still, his, his snow-white skin would forever be a testament to the time when he let his greed get the best of him. Because this is a story about greed. But I, I've been trying to give Gehazi the benefit of the doubt, at least a little bit, because he's, he's not a bad guy. He's not a villain. He's, he was never corrupt. But when the temptation came around, he fell guilty to it. Because even if he really did believe that he was doing the right thing, there were some telltale signs that even he knew that he was guilty. Because if you were ever having to lie and cover up what you're doing, then what you're doing is not good. And even if he wouldn't admit it to himself, Gehazi knew that what he was doing was wrong. If not, then why lie about it? Why try to cover it up? But there's something more to Gehazi's story than simply saying, don't be greedy. Now, greed was his sin. But Gehazi's downfall came through rationalization. Rationalization is about convincing ourselves that we can have good motives for bad conduct. Rationalization tells us that the end justifies the means. But plain and simple, it's about making excuses. Gehazi allowed himself to be fooled into thinking that his greed was okay. But if you set your mind to it, you can rationalize anything, whether it's greed or whatever it might be. Satan is very good at whispering rationalizations in our ear. You can twist the logic and justify in your mind any action. You may even use the Bible to do it. But through rationalization, Gehazi was able to transform his greed it, somehow he transformed it into obeying the will of God, saying that this is what God wants me to do. What happened? Well, church, this brings the, to mind the importance of wisdom and accountability, a theme which ties together the story of Gehazi and the stories that we've read in the last two weeks of Abigail and Nabal and Micaiah and Ahab. It takes a lot of strength to do what is right when you would much prefer to do what is wrong. And we can't always overcome temptation on our own. And that is why we need each other. Because as Christians, we need to hold each other accountable. Uh, how would this story have been different if Gehazi had run this idea by someone first? If there had been someone in his life to tell him, Gehazi, what are you doing? That is a terrible idea. Go home, Gehazi. Make sure that you have a few people in your life to keep you accountable whether they be family, mentors, or other church members. Because they need to be people that you can trust to call you out when you're wrong. And you need to be able to listen and to humbly accept that. And as a church, this is what we are to one another. 
we are a community that cares for each other, encourages one another, and when we need to, we gently rebuke one another. And I'm thankful for this. And I praise God that we don't have to go through this life alone because this life is hard and it is filled with difficult decisions, both large and small. But fortunately, God has given us a community of believers to live in, this body of Christ, and has given us the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes through spiritual communal discernment. And the good news is that if you're facing some tough choices in your life, as so many of us do, you don't have to go it alone. And if that's you right now, if you're going and you're just not sure what to do, or maybe you're pretty sure you know what to do, whether one way or the other, come to us. Pray with us. We will pray with you. And chances are, there just may be someone who is going through something similar or who has been through something similar and can speak from the wisdom of experience. Just don't go it alone. If that's you today, I encourage you to find someone to talk about it, someone to pray about it, someone to listen, and someone to listen to. That's you. You can talk to me. You can talk to one of the elders. You can talk to a Stephen minister. You can talk to anyone here. I encourage you. Share. Share what's going on. And if you're making that decision, you're thinking about the big decision. We got this baptistry back here. Pretty sure it's warm. If you're trying to make the decision to be baptized, to become a Christian, to receive that spirit and the forgiveness of your sins. Everyone here is going to tell you it is the best decision you will ever make in your life. Whatever your needs are, let us know. Don't go it alone, folks. Praise God for the community He has given us, for the body of Christ. And in all things, may God receive all glory, honor, and praise. Amen.